Welcome to Authentic Influence Live. This is Anthony Chansmoo from Simple Creative Marketing. And today we are learning how to grow your podcast with Charlie Valor. Welcome, Charlie. How are well, thank you? Thank you for having me, man. It's my pleasure to be here. Uh, it's been awesome to actually finally get the chance to get you onto this thing. I know we met a while ago back at Superfast Business Live uh, with James. And um, yeah, we had a good chat whilst we were there. And I just thought this is somebody at some point uh, I'd love to jam with because both of us are podcasters and we also both understand the value of building one's brand, one bi one's business uh, and one's audience um, if you want to do some cool things, right? So um, you're also not too far from me. Like I'm in Sydney and, and you're out... Uh, Remind me again where you are. Uh, I'm in the uh, most, uh, I think, the most toxic state of Australia. I think it's Melbourne. Is it uh, Victoria? Like, um, where, where are all the uh, adventurers in the world at the moment? <laughs> <laughs> That's right, five kilometer radius. <laughs> Fantastic. All right, so let's we'll go straight into it. Um, we're going to talk about really a strategy that you've been implementing for you and your clients at Valor Media, and um, you've got some really cool successes over the last few months. Do you want to just share a couple of those, and then we'll get into the strategy? Yeah, absolutely. So um, one of the things that's become more and more uh, frustrating for me, I'm going to say frustrating, but I, I want to act with empathy here, but at the same time is a huge amount of frustration is that over the last few years, we, we've seen a lot of podcasters or even content creators in general. At some point, the idea of more, just more and more, more posts, more platforms, more, more, more placements, more omnipresence became the way of doing it. And when you look at this right now, I see so many content creators trying to do so many things on so many platforms organically that it's kind of become just spam and noise. Like I'd make a bet that if we hopped on social media right now, one of us, there'd be some sort of post of someone that we might see, maybe, because only very few people would see it organically, of just people basically spamming out their message to people that don't really want it. They really don't want it. And I think this is the big shift of uh, 2020 and uh, something I've been leaning into a lot more is that we really need to rethink how we go about podcasting and content creation in general and revert that thinking to something I'm, I'm moving more towards the lines of fish where the fish are. And this is the big methodology and idea I've been working on this year now. To go into that, I just want to emphasize this here. By fishing where the fish are, it doesn't mean uh, going small by any means. Like as it stands currently, if I look across all the shows, including my own that we manage at Bella Media, we're managing about a million downloads a week now. Um, so we, we're doing some big numbers in that. And what is uh, really foreseen or been the big change in a lot of our shows, including my own, getting more success is taking this type of approach. It's getting away from that spray and pray. Put all your stuff everywhere as many times as you can. If you make a piece of content, make sure you repurpose it into the maximum amount of different pieces of content and put it on every social platform continually. Um, because attempt to grow your show, it just doesn't work. It's not the way to do it. Not the way to do it at all. Well, that definitely goes against the, I guess, the common message out there from the the podcast experts, um, you know, speech marks, uh, and that's that's the, the the thing, right? Like trying to get it out. You talk about omnipresence, get it out there, get onto as many channels, you know, and and um, you know, spray and pray is probably the tactic that we're talking about. So. Uh, now you've adjusted that and you've really been honing the the, the strategy and, and really working around the mindset of um, not doing that. So what's the alternative? And um, let's talk about the fish. So you're using this fish analogy. So let's explain it to the audience here. And, and what does that actually mean? Well, I think to your point there, something you just really nailed on. Five years ago, this worked. Like spray and pray, go for it. Be in as many places as possible all at once. And you probably will catch enough where it'll be be worth it. But for those same experts that have already built their audience, that's fine for them. So if you're already the Pat Flynn's, the James Shramko's, the Oprah's, the Gary V's, keep, keep doing what you're doing. You've, you've earned your audience. You've got it there. But that type of advice for someone starting out or someone that hasn't gotten past, let's say, 100,000 downloads a month, it's terrible. Absolutely terrible. Okay, so I um, got asked to do a training uh, early this year and I always, whenever I make a training, I always like to put together the idea of like, what's a concept or an idea that I can plant in someone's head where they're going to walk away from this training and they're going to be going, ah, oh, fish where the fish are, fish where the fish are. Like really, really like, you know, inception level, deep, deep seed here. And I, I built this whole methodology, methodology around that. It, abs it hit, like people really got it. So I've decided to start leaning that into a bit more and like bring it out from here. So what we're going to do, or hopefully what we're going to do here is we're, we're going to start being fishermen. 
like that's going to be our mood amps. We're going to go through this. All right. So well, I've put my hat on, so I'm ready to go. I, I, do you know what? I've been trying to get hold of a fishing hat. I thought it'd be perfect for this uh, show in itself, but um, nonetheless, I, I will resist. <laughs> uh, but okay, so the, the first thing when I think about this, right, is like, and I actually have a family member who's incredibly obsessed with fishing, and it's it's so interesting to see how much he puts into it and how much of it is relatable here. But the first thing I noticed with um, my relative, which I won't name him just because I haven't got his permission, but um, what he actually does before he does anything is he, he's very clear on like what fish he's trying to catch. Like he's very, very clear on that. Like I, I don't think there's a fisherman out there that kind of goes, well, we'll just kind of wing it, you know, like we might be getting crabs or we, we might be getting deep water sharks. Like it's, it's all just the same, like say, same, same, same. doesn't matter what fish we want, same thing applies. So I think the first important step if we're going to adopt this thinking of fish where the fish are is like, well, what fish are we trying to actually catch? Getting hyper-specific on, on that type of uh, thinking that assesses from there. So once we know uh, what fish we're trying to catch, it's interesting that the instantly you're able to shift from trying to be everywhere to going, well, where's the best place to catch those fish? Like if you want to catch salmon, like there's only certain parts of the world where you can get salmon. You can't just get it anywhere. Like I can't go down to my local beach and just get salmon. Like it doesn't happen. Like there's very specific fishing holes that work out. And I, and I will stand by this. Every market, every niche has places that are better or worse for your market. And I see this routinely in the shows we look after is like certain types of shows like B2B stuff doing really well on LinkedIn. Fitness does really well on Instagram. Um, I'm finding that there's certain uh, high search query niches that do really well on YouTube because there's so many people like hanging out looking for those things. So when you start to understand like, you know, not only the platform, but the device, you can really lean into being a much better fisherman and actually, you know, really start to think about, well, am I getting my show near, near the right fish? Now, after that, so, we, you know, we've worked out this idea of, okay, I know what fish I'm going after. I know where they are. As soon as you know those two things, the equipment side of it starts to make a lot more sense. And um, this is the one that stands out to me is um, my relative is into fishing, right? He, he is really, really into that deep water stuff. Like, so he has a boat right? Because he has to get out to the deep water. But for people that are maybe into crabbing, they don't really need a boat. Like that's like a short water game. So when you've kind of lined these up and you start to think about, well, how, how does this apply in the world of podcasting or content? I think you really have to lean into the idea, well, if you, you know, know you're going to be on YouTube, you probably want to do video. Or if you know that, uh, for example, your audience is, on B2, is in a B2B market and we're on LinkedIn, well, then you want to be paying more attention to, well, 10 minute formats because that's what works on LinkedIn. And maybe it should be square instead of rectangle. Like we're bringing in the right equipment to get the job done. And I think this applies at a deeper level as well. Like I'll put it out there. I'm, I'm a pretty casual type of guy, but this type of look wouldn't really work um, if it was a fitness show. Like I'm clearly not the image of fitness. So maybe I would want to shoot this in a gym might, might be a better way or in a different world again it's like if this was high level finance and we're talking about you know bond yields and spreads this is probably not the persona my audience wants to play with like maybe i get a bit more dressed up for that so i think this applies on multi-level of just like looking as your ideal audience would want you to look but also being in those places that they would expect and again this is like so counterintuitive to what has become the norm of like spray and pray but I feel like these first three things as we look at it, and there's a few more here, but just add so much to the idea of like how we can do so much better with our content. Yeah, I really like just this idea of dressing up for purpose. So, and to your point, to dressing for channel. So, you know, or, or where the pond is, right? So if you are uh, B2B and your audience you're talking to are, you know, business owners and whatnot or SMEs, uh, then you really, and that's predominantly who our audience are, they're, they're you know, uh, freelancers or they are um, small businesses who are either working with us, other small businesses or those who are trying to get into corporate, sort of get the corporate clients, right? So um, in, in that sense, you really do want to appear a certain way, right? Because it does, it actually, it does actually help uh, your the message that, you know, you don't want what you're, how you present yourself to become the block to the message that you're trying to, to deliver. And we've seen that happen, you know, um, I know two stuff that's too personal appearing on LinkedIn, right? Um, <laughs> right, like, um, and you're going, yeah, okay, but this isn't the water cooler. This isn't the the the, the city break, right? So you know you got to be careful, and you don't know who's looking, right? And that's the, the challenge with these sort of things. Um, and I noticed on Instagram as well, people trying to do B two B on Instagram, and just it's just not resonating because I'm scrolling through my feed and I'm seeing 
all you talk about the fitness people and the, and the health and wellness people and, and those like they're doing these images and they're doing these videos that come up and things like that and it looks really nice on a visual feed on on instagram but then you have someone there trying to talk about copywriting or whatever it is and it just it doesn't it doesn't taste no. right yeah it doesn't taste right there's right. friction there. so it's like uh, and I, i'm just look at this right now and i'm like every piece of content we make and we publish costs money to produce right so someone had to make that instagram image and it's like if you're creating that abrasive nature i just look at it right now and say well it, it might not be the right fit and instagram might be a great platform for your business but in general i, I want to revert people i think too many people are trying to go too wide before they've gone narrow and done it really really well now to your point there like dressing it up i mean do i look like the epitome of podcasting right now got, i mean the boom arms in the shot the big headphones yes. got got the light in the background like if anyone is thinking of doing podcasting like i, I am dressed to impress my audience no one else just my audience that's it. That's all that, that matters. <laughs> really. So tell me about some of the uh, other. I mean, you talk about spray and pray, but what are some of the other things that people are doing uh, to really mess it up in, when they're trying to, to build a podcast audience or a content audience? All right. So let's go to this like next level deeper into this. So let's say we've got to this point. We've, we're going through this process at the moment, and it's like, okay, well, I've got the right equipment, and I'm there. The one that I think is probably done poorly these days, or probably this is one of the biggest areas is if you were fishing, right? And let's say you got to this spot and you got there and you, you, your um, fishing rod is hanging over the edge. Like what's the gap between the fish being on that rod? Like what's the gap? It's it's the bait. Yeah. Right? If you've got the right bait, it is so much easier to catch a fish than if you've got no bait or the wrong bait. And I'll say the wrong bait is probably uh, more detrimental in, in many, many ways these days. So what I think has happened, particularly in podcasting, and, and I, I've got to be careful how I say this. I might step on some toes, but, you know, I'll step on them anyway. I think too many people are trying to make the podcast content they want to make instead of the mm. podcast content that their audience wants. So, like, if I was out there fishing for salmon, right, and I'm putting, I don't know, a uh, iPhone on the end of it. We'll go with that because that's in front of me. And I'm sitting there and I'm like, wow, people, why aren't the fish biting? Like what, what's going on here? Why don't they want an iPhone? I'm interested in iPhones. I'm going to make a podcast on iPhones. Like surely everyone else wants this. And this is like one of those things where I look at in today's marketplace is like I think there's an ego thing going on where people want to feel important. But to look at this from here is like let's create the content that the audience wants instead of the other way around. And I think that can make a really huge difference. And over, overwhelmingly, I've worked with a lot of podcasters now. I've done a lot of podcast audits. It disturbs me how little effort people put into actually researching what their content is, what their audience wants, and really aligning that. And I, I think that's probably one of the most underutilized things. So the right bait, let's let like let's start making content on the right topics that people actually want to consume. And I think you'll find that your content marketing or your podcast growth, it's so much easier from there. All right. So how do we find the right bait? Because that's going to be the, probably someone watching this going, okay, get it, Charlie. Like we want to, you know, make sure that we've, we're getting, we're not putting an iPhone on the, on the end of the hook there. We actually want to put some perhaps live bait if that's what the salmon wants. Um, so how do we go about that? What's the, what's the process that you typically recommend? All right. So th these are the methods I use personally. There are other ones. This is one of those ones where I think there's a few ways to get to the same destination, but this is something I found to be probably the most effective. What's great here is you don't have to guess. Like I, I think this is probably the thing I would say is that if you're guessing this, you, you're viewing it all wrong. And I'll, I'll start with what I think is the most important. If you are a business owner and you've got existing clients, the content that would best serve them is the content you should be making. I think you should look to your clients first because if you've got great clients and you're looking to replicate that in some way or you're trying to replicate people for the type of people that are already buying from you, then I would say, yeah, that's the way to do it. Let, let's go that way. But if you don't have that, maybe you're in a different type of business and you go, well, Charlie, that's great. I don't have any clients yet. I'm a startup. Like, how do I do this from here? So then the second component of it that becomes really, really interesting is that if you're not trying to spray and pray it and you know which platforms that your audience is already on, well, you can start doing research there. You can see what other fishermen are putting out as bait and how that's coming to be. So rather than viewing these platforms in the way of like, okay, well, what, what can I get out of it? I think it's actually quite interesting to look at other fishermen and what's working for them. And you can discern a lot for that on every platform. So I'll go through them. You can go on YouTube and type in relevant search terms or look at things like that and see what's performing. 
you can go on Instagram and see what content's performing there. You can go on LinkedIn. All these platforms allow you the ability to do research on what other businesses are doing, the way they're going about it to understand it from there. So that's the next thing. I do like a bit of down and dirty research. I think that is fantastic. But I'll throw in a few others that I think are particularly interesting. I'm a really big fan of uh, Amazon for research. I like to see where people are spending money. You know, if someone's willing to open their wallet and buy a book on a topic, and even I'll read into the reviews on that book or what's happening there, I think that's a really powerful intent. So I love digging around on Amazon and seeing what a niche is doing uh, from there. What's the books they're buying? What's the products they're buying? What are they saying about in the reviews? If you ever see this sentence, oh, it was great, but it didn't cover X. I love that sentence. That's normally a really good sign there. Um, so that's another favorite one. And then another one, someone we both know, we got to see them uh, earlier this year is like uh, Tim Sulo from Ahrefs. I've probably butchered it. I don't know if it's Ahrefs, Ahrefs. <laughs> but I think their tool is absolutely fantastic uh, for keyword research and content gap, which is what it's called within it for actually finding terms and ideas as well. So th they're my go-tos for kind of research in itself. And I think that's really powerful. But I would say one of the other ones to just really, really look at is that if you were, you know, every business is in the business of transformation. So like they start somewhere, they do business with you, and then after it, they're different. So you sell a product, you know, your product solves a pro uh, problem or solution or a service solves a problem or a solution the way I think about it. And I, I always think some of the best content we can make is if someone's before they've worked with us and they're going to need to get to after they've worked with us, what do I need to say or educate them on to help them make that transition? And often that's a really good uh, digging point for there for understanding what content we should be making as well. Yeah, what I'm hearing is to really remove the assumptions because one of the biggest mistakes that we can really make, and I learned this when I started my copywriting journey, you know, five, six years ago, was I was writing things that I thought, yeah, you know, it's a hot topic. I'm, I'm seeing media releases, I'm seeing publications, I'm seeing, you know, Gary Vee talk about it. Uh, and then I realized, but that's not really what, if I go enter a room and I talk to someone face to face, that's not really what they care about, right? It's like, no, I just want to make sure that whatever I publish, you know, is educating my potential buyer in some way. Uh, and then I had to then understand, okay, well, who's your client? And then based on who the client was, what's the language do they do they use? Do they resonate with this fishing analogy or is it, is it something else, right? So um, that's a really critical component. And I like your Amazon tip because I think you can learn a lot about what people are thinking uh, in those reviews because people are actually, you know, verbatim putting down what they're thinking uh, in the reviews in their, the, in the, using the language they would normally speak with right so you can actually go oh, well that's the way they're going to say it because uh, do you no notice that as well like in particularly in the b2b space we tend to get very jargony like it's really easy to start talking about you know road mics and all these sort of things we jump into the technology uh and then if we're going to a newbie podcaster or someone trying to create something new they just have no idea and they're just like charlie just tell me like just give me a microphone to start with i don't need to know everything about it uh, hugely, this is the curse of knowledge. Like most mm. people spend their time talking about the thing instead of the result they should be getting from the thing. Like, and I find that hugely common, especially in anything techie. Like as soon as you go into that realm, it's very common that people want to talk about the thing. Um, the second part of that is the curse of knowledge. So once you know something, you can't necessarily unknow it. So we forget what it's like to be that beginner who doesn't grasp those concepts yet. And uh, I'll give you an example. Like I, I've bought a caravan recently. So it's awesome. I'm like a new caravaner. I'm like, yeah, like, let's get into it. And like, there's all these terminologies and jargons and people talking about, you know, oh, what's your, you know, your gross vehicle mass and is that a 12 volt <laughs> system? And, you know, are you on grid or off grid? And oh, is that a three way fridge? And I'm just like, yep. <laughs> <laughs> but this comes back down. If you know your, um, if we, we take this earlier, if you know what fish you're typing to catch, is your fish a beginner fish, you know, an intermediate fish or an advanced fish? Or if you started creating content in your podcast and you didn't know what fish you were catching properly, you kind of knew, this is where you would get found out. Because if you went jargony when it's like, no, 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 these people need to be like, okay, well, what is a microphone and how do I use it? When do I need a USB mic versus a three-pin mic like I have now? Like, If you truly know what fish you're trying to catch, speaking to them at that language is a part of it. It becomes more important. 100%. All right, so we talked about getting clear on what fish you want to catch, getting the right equipment, going to the spot, so you're there, um, you've done your research, now what do we do? How do we make sure that um, we're still moving in the right direction? Yeah, so um, I, I had this false belief, right? So I, again, I'll refer to my relative that's into this fishing thing. 
like when a fish gets on the hook, I just kind of thought, oh, you just reel it in. And like, um, you realize how offensive that is to someone who does fishing. It's like, no, 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 there's technique to that. You can't just like turn the handle and they just come in the boat. And I'm like, what do you mean? Again, to my novice fisherman uh, skills here. But I found it very, very interesting that when you understand that depending on what fish you're going after, there's different circumstance to like bring them to the boat. And I, I think of it in here as like, well, you can't just do one good episode. You can't just get the fish on the hook and clickbait them, right? You've, you've got to really like reel them in. And this means consistency. This is the thing where you've got to be continually working at it. And you can't just release one good episode. You've got to stay the course consistently here and repetitively to value this audience. And then that's how you have a really good fishing trip. Like that's a thing that makes um, quite an interesting experience in itself. So consistently great content is just so much a part of this journey. I think it's it's really, really important. Now throw a caveat in there. Um, when, when I was a younger lad, I, I went up to a place in Australia called Cairns. Have you heard of Cairns? Yeah, I've been to Cairns. Great spot. Is Alligators. It? <laughs> the the uh, I, I'm not sure which one, as I said. Yeah. <laughs> but we went on this um, fishing charter, right? So we went on this fish. It's probably my only real experience with fishing, the irony. Um, but you know what was really interesting? When they got a fish in the boat, the process they had for looking after that fish was amazing. So as soon as they got it, they got it in the boat, they'll weigh and measure it, which I'll talk about that momentarily. If it was suitable, they would get it on ice and then the whole plan was to get it back so you could actually uh, eat that fish for dinner if you should so choose. All right, that was the end. Uh, release the fish that were too small because there's all rules around fishing and what you can and can't do depending on that's uh, in the area. Now, I thought it was really fascinating like how good the process was once they had someone in the boat. And I've, bringing this back to podcasting, if, you, if you've got a podcast and you've got a really great process of turning them into a customer for your business – kind of applies here. It's like, you know, what do they do next? Do you bring them onto your email list? Is it having a call with you? Are, are you living up to that expectation that anyone that's listening to your content is on board? Do you have that process in it to turn it into dinner in this case here? So bringing in the boat and looking after it, I just think is so essential. And most of the podcasts I review don't have a good call to action, aren't taking people to any next steps and are really asking them to like, you know, guess and luck their way through doing business with them. They don't make it easy to understand, well, what do I do next year? How can I get help? And if you're helping someone in your podcast, I just think, well, if you can make it cheaper, faster, or easier to get the result, like you should sell often because that's <laughs> what your audience wants too. It's like how, how evil would it be for you to um, just talk about, um, for example, like bookkeeping continually and then never help people with that? That's almost <laughs> cruel. <laughs> Big tease. <laughs> Huge tease. So okay, let's talk about call to action because you mentioned that. So what what is a, a good example of a you know a good call to action versus a terrible one, um, and when should you actually place that in the episode? Good points, good points. Let's go there. A terrible call to action is something like, well, if you would look, if you'd like some more help with your podcast, well then just come over to Vela Media and, and we'll help you do it. That's a terrible call to action. I see that often. Hmm. Like this, like people are aware of what I do, but I'm not like I'm not very motivating where I really like specific call to action. So what I, I like to think is like, you know, if you're having trouble with X, then head here to solve that. So and if you're in the position where you want to grow your podcast in the next 30 days, we can help you with that. Go to this link and, and get the result. Or really promoting a specific resource. I'll give you an example here. I mean, if you've liked this Facebook Live we're doing together here, and you would like the companion guide to go with this so you can go through these steps yourself, head to Valimedia dot uh, com slash uh, resources or the link camp has on the screen now and you can actually get this and go through the process we're talking about so I, I like call to actions that are specific it's very very clear what you're going to get from that so no generalized um, call to actions now as for the placements there's two places i like them once at the beginning in the intro and then once at the end and the reason we do both is because all podcasts have drop-off rates so we like to think that if you've got the most attention at the start and it's not to be abrasive, but it's like people will just generally not be aware of it and you need to make them aware. And it's probably not the first time they've listened to your show. So they've already got that relationship where you can mention things. And then, of course, at the end is just that reminder. So they're my two favorite spots from there. Really, really, really good tips there. Um while she was talking about that, my brain started looking. I've got visuals of fish in ponds now. Thanks, Charlie. Uh, it was it. It was <laughs> and I'm going, okay, the, does the platform of choice matter? Because obviously we've got Spotify, we've got uh, Apple Podcasts, we've got Stitcher and all these different things. Does that 
play into what you're talking about here in terms of the, the pond? Or are you talking more specifically about where is the, the platform in terms of uh, where you promote the podcast, such as your social media channels? Okay, so a uh, really good point. I should have elaborated on that. That is that is my fault from here. It does, if you're doing a podcast and it's a video podcast on YouTube or it's an audio podcast on iTunes or Spotify, all of them have the ability to put show notes or a place to put links within them, all of them. Even if you're doing LinkedIn, you can put links in your with your videos for people to click on. Like there's always a place to put a link if you want someone to take that next step. I would still, in the content piece, vocalize that you want someone to click on that. So you would talk into it and say that it's in your description or wherever you are on that platform and that you can click here to take that next step. It's really important that you make it easy to take the next step. Like you put your link with that call to action. You don't make it general and then make people go search your website or do other things. So you always want to place it with things like that. It makes a really huge difference as well. Cool. Thanks for the clarity on that. So is there anything additional steps in terms of the phishing uh, strategy? Is there anything else that we need to know? Yeah, absolutely. There's one more, right? This is a, quite a fascinating one. Do you, do you? I don't know how many fishermen you know. I only know one in my charter experience, but in both times, do you know what happened? What? Well, they keep records because they've got these secret spots. Mm. Once they find a good spot, they sure as hell don't forget it. They write it down. They're very, very um, good at keeping records. So what I look at at that is if you find a, a fishing hole in the reference here or a spot you, that's working for you, Remember it, go back to it, use it often because that's how the fishermen will behave. And I think that's something we've got to look at introducing here. So can you give us an example of keeping records? Is, like, is that on practical sense, is that a spreadsheet somewhere and you've gone, okay, this is where these are the channels that worked or these are the, um, the guests that brought the most um, downloads or these sort of things? Is that what you're talking about here? Yeah, let's lean into that a little bit. I'll give you some examples. All right, so number one I would say is that if you're doing a podcast, undoubtedly you have podcast stats. So if you're not going back and looking at your podcast stats at like what episodes you've got the best downloads or the least downloads, you're probably doing your show a disservice in general. I think it's important to do that. And I really like the idea of doing more of the style of episodes that work and less of the ones that don't work. And in general, that is to the point of what we're making here. Is fish where the fish are is to do more of what's working and less of what is. So that that's point one. The, the second point I would really like to make in there is uh, in my own show, something I've really, really noticed in my own podcast, the business of podcasting, is anytime I cover a topic on growing a podcast, uh, making great podcast content, or monetizing a podcast, it does pretty well. Equipment guides and things like that haven't been the best episodes for me. So knowing those categories, like I'm keeping records of like, hey, this is the stuff that really works. I'm able to keep repeating it and covering it in different ways and working with the show in there. And then thirdly, you can apply this to like your call to actions and traffic sources as well. So I look at this right now and say, well, for me, you know, certain guides and resources have done better. We promote more of them. Some we've tried have been an absolute flop. We, we don't promote them anymore. We don't use a call to action on that. We might make a bigger guide on that. And I think that's really important to uh, know about your own market and show. Yeah, I think that's just really, we're getting the business end of, of podcasting. <laughs> Only content marketing is to actually track and measure uh, and, and really look at, okay, what, as what you say there, know what's working and do more of what's working and start to Absolutely. reduce what's not working. Um, we have limited time and resources, so we want to make sure we focus. Now, I just want to, before we sort of wrap up here, there are a couple of things that you mentioned on a post that you shared maybe a week ago um, on Facebook uh, around just some results that you, you had with, one or two of your clients and um they were fantastic um and you talked about a few of the things that you did to to change or well, you know their strategy uh, and one of those you mentioned was niching down now i think this relates to the first point or the first point of the, the strategy here which is really get clear on what fish you want to catch and then find out what pond they're in um now talk about micro niching and niching and that idea because i know some people are very resistant to that but there's a fear, right? Uh, I'm a digital, I'm a content strategist, so I need to talk about content and there's content can be a million different things, um, I'm, but I don't want to narrow any further than that or I don't know how to narrow. Um, so what's an example of where you've seen niching or micro niching work really well for, for, for you or your clients? Yes, yeah, so that's a really interesting one. I'll give you some examples. So even in my own podcast now, it's like I have a podcast called The Business of Podcasting. It's very specifically only about the business of podcasting. We, we don't cover a lot of things. Getting to that point, though, it started as a show about media. So that it was actually all about media and content and like different, different avenues you can take it and incorporating video. And 
Uh, what I realized very, very quickly is that although my ego wanted to serve more people, my download numbers weren't matching. <laughs> and I, I think my frustration of, of first discovering this was just through the poor performance of my own things. And the more narrow I go, like I mentioned the three things I cover, there's more things I could definitely cover, but I stay away from it because I know this is a core component where I can do really well and we create raving fans and, and do really great work. So becoming more narrow has helped my own show immensely. But I'll, I'll give you an example of a few more we've uh, really leaned into from here. Um, the ones that stand out, there, there's a few kind of core categories that I, I think of, which is like some people will do like uh, marketing. Like a really broad marketing show instead of like a niche marketing show, which is maybe on SEO or even like SEO for e-commerce. And I think categories like marketing, bringing them into that lane has done a lot better, a lot better. Health and fitness, like broad health or broad fitness shows might've worked a while ago. But the layers I like to see in those industries now is like, let's say you're in that space. I would much rather see a show that's for, okay, well, you're in your thirties and you want to be a bodybuilder and you're in a certain country. Like go that niche now that can be really, really uh, specific. Like it's so much more specific you can go. And I, I've used this example for people, right? I, I think this is the best way to do it. I think everyone can imagine this. Like you're at a gym and for whatever reason, you're the you're the fitness instructor, okay? You are the fitness instructor. So you're going to be up there in your, your little hot shorts and you're going to run this run this class really well. And like people start coming into the class. And the first guy that comes in, you know, he's with his mate. He's uh, 30 years old. He's ripped. He's 120 kilos. He's a monster right? Complete professional bodybuilder. And he goes and he stands there and he's like getting ready for the class. Then the next person that comes in is a 40 uh, year old mum. She's, she's a family girl. She just dropped the, the kids off at school right? and she just wants to be healthy. And then the third one that comes in is an 18 year old who wants to be an Instagram model. Okay. And then the fourth one is like a senior, like someone who's mm -hmm. just trying to look after their house. Now, if you're standing up there and you're looking out of this and you're going, how do you run this class? Like, because as soon as you say something, you're going to alienate someone. And as soon as you try and um, do an exercise, well, the bodybuilder, like he's going to lift anything, but the pensioner might throw his back. And I think <laughs> that the idea is that we've got a whole bunch of people up in the front of that class, just it's virtual. And they're trying to please this class instead of being able to communicate specifically and help a certain segment get that type of result. So I, I love the idea of people recognizing that the more you create the ability to communicate effectively because you can speak the language of that person and then also help that specific person get a greater result and a more specific result you realize that the class design for each one of these people individually is there so design your class really make your class the secret to your niche here yeah i really like that just focus on you talked about it before transformation what's the actual transformation that you can provide um, for you know a particular person individual uh, type of business, type of, you know, um, audience, and, and then really go go down into that. So it's like for us, you use the examine of, you know, the, the salmon fishermen versus the tuna fishermen, right? Like they, they have very different tastes and probably the equipment might vary, um, the boats might vary. Uh, and so depending on who you're talking to, if you want to capture someone's intention, you really, you want them to know that, hey, like, I know exactly what you're going through. Um, and there's a there's an adage that, you know, I'm sure you've heard it, which is, um, you know, if, if you're trying to serve everyone, you end up serving nobody or you end up serving no one. Uh, and so that's kind of what you're saying there. Really like that. Now, one more thing. You also said that, uh, I'll quote you. You said, I will happily pay a premium to get my podcast in front of the people. It is designed to help over the masses who will do nothing with it. Can you uh, elaborate on that? Yeah, def definitely. Let, let's go there. Um, okay. Uh, how can I frame this up? I, I, we have a client, I won't name them because they're the, the cause of this post. <laughs> Um, but they've got a podcast with about 75,000 downloads a month, um, which is not a small podcast. They've done really, really well to create a podcast of that size, um, but they're going to go broke because they're not making any money from it at all, right? So they've got this situation that's happened here where they've bought or built this generalized audience that's just not really designed for anything. And as they try and monetize it into a specific marketing service, it's going terribly. Like I actually think that would be better off starting over. So after years of building up something they think of as an asset, it's actually a liability because they have to pay hosting, got email list to go with it. Like it's an expensive operation to run that isn't served at all. And when we look at this, like in contrast to another show I work with, um, it's only a small show, right? It's a very, very small show, but reaching these guys, we run a lot of paid traffic. 
Now, what I what I love about that is I pay so much more per person to get them to this show. So I pay Facebook ads to get this content in front of the right person who's exactly that right fit. I put that right bait in front of them, like it's the right bait for them. But the amount of people that turn into a, a really good customer for this business, it's like this crazy contrast. I've got one guy over here, 75,000 a month of downloads, um, struggling, and I mean struggling to keep this business afloat with this idea and move ideas. And then conversely, I've got this person that wouldn't get 750 downloads a week. Like they wouldn't, uh, maybe they get four or 5,000 downloads a month, but like hand over fist, this thing is so, so profitable. The return on investment is just a crazy, crazy difference from there. And when I look at that and think about it, I know whose shoes I would rather be in. Like I know which person I would rather be. Yeah, hundred percent. If you're listening and watching live, I like to put you put in the comments like, "What? Well, which person would you like to be?" <laughs> um, really good examples. So let's wrap it up here, Charlie. I really value you for coming on today and just sharing some insights and the strategy. I love, um, you know, that it's not about luck. It's actually go, let's go fish where the fish are. You have that resource, and you can anyone listening to this, I recommend you go check it out. You can head over to simplecreativemarketing.com forward slash go fish or Valor Media dot com forward slash resources whichever one works both of them work um and uh go if you want to learn more about the strategy and connect with charlie and what he's doing definitely highly recommend it and also have a listen to charlie's podcast as well because i've been tuning into some of those episodes uh and you get some great great guests on there and um, fun banter as well so thank you any last messages for our audience before we wrap up oh, can i put one more in i've got room yeah, for one okay so um a lot of people ask me is like should i do more than one episode of a podcast per week mm. should i do like five episodes a week and I just want to leave people with this final thought of like where I think content marketing and podcasting is going in general. When is the last time you went out on a Friday night and go, I'm going to see five shit movies instead of one good one? Like when's the last time you saw that? It's like, no, 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 the Avengers, we could see that or we could see five terrible movies and that will be better. I haven't done it. So my, my message to a lot of people out here is like create that, like go for quality. Like I just really want to finish on the idea that if you were fishing where the fish are, Go for quality. Go for quality. Don't try and be cheap and crap and do ample. Less is more and, uh, yeah, quality over quantity. That's what you're saying. <laughs> All right, mate. Love it. Thanks so much for your time. And, uh, again, everybody, valormedia.com. That's Charlie's website. Go over there and, uh, yeah, he's the man if you want any help with your podcast. Thank you, everyone. See you guys real soon. Oh.